Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out in this snowy weather. Um, let me just make sure that I, I make the clicking machine do the clicker thing. Hold on here. <laughs> uh, hold on here. All right. So welcome to the Google Podcast Creator Program Showcase. My name is Kristen Meinzer, and I am your host for the evening, and I am so excited to be here in your beautiful town, which my late mother called her hometown for over a decade, and it is her favorite city in the world because it's filled with beautiful people who are smart and welcoming, and I just feel so happy to be here with all of you. So thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna try this clicking machine again. I'm, I'm a little bit of a luddite, so let's see if I can figure out how to do this here. Uh, maybe I'll click over there. I'm gonna click over here. That's yeah, yes. Welcome. <laughs> all right, let's try. It. Oh, here we go. Yes, all right, you are all in for a treat tonight. Tonight you're going to be introduced to six up-and-coming podcasts from around the world. These teams have been working hard for the past five months, defining their audience, developing their shows, and incorporating lots and lots of feedback. Now, be prepared, because you're about to take a journey across four continents. You're going to laugh, you're going to cry, you're gonna cringe. You're gonna have moments of self-recognition that you kind of wish that you didn't have. There's gonna be at least one moment where I swear half the room is gonna say, hold on, is that my mom? It's not your mom, but you're gonna think it's your mom. I'm not kidding. And by the end of the night, I promise you, you will have fallen in love. You will fall in love like you once did in those innocent carefree years when any kind of moment that could have been scary you weren't afraid of because you just felt the love. That's how much love you're going to feel tonight for all of these shows, all of these programs. But first, let me just introduce myself again. Um, as I was saying earlier, my name is Kristen Meinzer. And most people know me as the co-host of a show called By the Book. By the Book is a reality show podcast in audio form. In each episode of the show, my friend Jolenta Greenberg and I choose a different self-help book to live by. We, we break down all of the rules, we follow the rules to the letter, and then we record ourselves at work, at home, and in the world so you can hear how each book enhances or destroys our marriages or our lives, <laughs> oftentimes both. Now, some examples of books we've lived by, if you can see the left here, that's the life-changing magic of tidying up. And in that moment, my husband, Dean, is being forced to touch every item we own to determine whether or not the item sparks joy. As you can see, there's a lot of joy there. Lower right-hand corner, we are living by Miracle Morning, the book that promises if you wake up at 5 a.m. every day, you will become a level 10 person. I still don't know what a level 10 person is. And then on the upper right, this is when my husband and I were living by the secret. And something magical happens in the secret. If you believe in something strong enough, you can make it happen. Because there's an actual scientific equation that says thoughts become things. Listen. You should just drive. I'm going to do it. I'm going I'm to manifest it. Here. See, I'm moving my hand. The slow car is moving into the slow lane. I no, 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 you're laughing at me. I'm totally going to do it. I'm totally going to do it. Look, infinity, Q, R, whatever that car is, you're going to move to the right lane. I'm doing the Tai Chi move. It wants to do it. Oh, God, there it goes. There it goes. Oh. Ah, it's going. <laughs> it's going. You did it. See ya, so sucker. sucker. <laughs> Yes, all you do is have to think it and it will come true. That's the secret. Um, now, of course, other people know me for another show that uh, is called When Megan Met Harry. This is a podcast that launched right around the same time that Meghan Markle and Prince Harry announced their engagement, their royal engagement, and it culminated with my co-host James Barr and I attending the royal wedding itself. And much like Meghan and Harry, we liked to think that we reflected the royal couple. I'm an American woman of color. He is a redheaded man from the UK. Um, that, those are the only things we have in common with them, actually. That's it. Anywho, that show led 
to us becoming regular royal wedding correspondents for the CBC and for the BBC, and I was written up as one of the top three royal fanatics in America. And here at the wedding, as you can see, we actually got to make eye contact with Megan. That's Megan looking me directly in the eye. That's a picture I took with my phone. And here we are at the most important moment of possibly not just their lives, but my own and the whole world's. Oh. Wait, who is that? Oh, oh my, my God. God. Is that Megan? Oh my God. Oh, it is, it is. Oh. Oh. Look, a train for days. She has three quarter length I'm sleeves. I'm so happy. A simple, beautiful, classic architectural gown, just as I predicted. A veil going for days. The veil is unbelievable. The veil is unbelievable. She looks Megan looks so like an angel. stunning. I still feel that there's some Hollywood in there. Oh but my it's gosh. So classy. Look at that. The veil is, is amazing. Whoa! Oh. Clearly we really like the veil. <laughs> um, and uh, in addition to that, I'm also known by many people just as a culture critic. I used to review films on a podcast called Movie Date from WNYC, and I did that for six years. Uh, I also still regularly appear on shows as a guest to talk about made-for-television movies, specifically Christmas made-for-TV movies, Dolly Parton, and any kind of culture that uh, has an intersection between gender, race, class, and consumerism. That's kind of my specialty. And I'm an author. So the first book I ever wrote was called Return to Intercourse, an Amish Romance. I wrote this book. Um, so at one point, Joe Lent and I, in by the book, were living by a book called How to Write an E-Book in Less Than 7 to 14 Days That Will Make You Money Forever. I wrote this book in less than 7 to 14 days, whatever that number means. And um, it is still making dozens of dollars a year. I also wrote a book that came out a couple months ago called So You Want to Start a Podcast, which um, I wanted to give people a step-by-step -step guide that was straightforward, that also had great storytelling components woven in, because I think a lot of the other books out there uh, weren't actually paying attention to story, to structure, to how you build an audience, to all the things that I want people to pay attention to, but also to diversity. How do you lift up women's voices? How do you bring, bring people of color to the table? All of these things were important to me, and so I decided to write my own book because there wasn't one out there that was doing those things. And then finally, I have a book with Jolenta coming out in March called How to Be Fine, What We Learn from Living by the Rules of 50 Self-Help Books, which is exactly what it sounds like. And clue, not very much. Okay. And in addition to all that, I also do my best to equal the playing field. A big part of my life is mentoring women and people of color. And I guest lecture at public universities. Here I am at UT Austin giving a keynote a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, teach I teach organizations how to diversify their audio teams and their content. This is something I'm very, very much committed to. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be with you today because the Google Podcast Creator Program is all about representing the voices of everyone in our community, including those who mainstream media often ignore. And that brings us to tonight's show. Now, I just met these teams today. Let me do this again, is it working? I don't know if it is. All right, um, I just met the teams you're about to meet today. And you know what? When you see them, you're going to be blown away. They are so confident. They are ready to premiere their shows. But I'm told that back in August, when everyone was just meeting for the first time, things were a little different. Take a look. Much of what we think in the podcasting landscape right now is very US-centric, and it's very English language dominant. And one of the things that we hope at PRX and with the Google Podcast Creator Program is to broaden the sense of who out there is making podcasts. This is our second group of teams. They're all working on different types of shows, different topics and formats. Podcasting in Brazil is kind of a new thing if you think about professionally produced shows. So this opportunity is so amazing for us. 
it's really exciting to be in a place where everybody's talking about podcasting. Everybody's really invested in making the best podcast that they can make. I've been blown away by the storytelling coming from around the world in my particular cohort. For me, it's like a, a privilege to be here, you know, surrounded by a, a lot of people from different countries. It's, it's amazing to feel like from day one part of a new community. I think we were all just able to communicate and talk to each other very, very easily because it was almost like our interests were all exactly in the same place. Being able to talk about what's your interview style, what kind of editing software do you use, what kind of microphone do you use. And one of the great things about this program is it builds podcast community and it allows you to see things in a different point of view and different perspectives. We're learning so much every day from the PRX team and also from the other teams. We are teaching these teams how to measure success for themselves as well as how to make their show sustainable. We really ask teams to think about who they are making the podcast for. And we do this through a process called design thinking. I love the process. I love the fact that you know you start off with this research and then you go into who your stakeholders are and so on and so forth. Losing the fear to, to give ideas, to propose, to create, for me, that's something, that's something really awesome because we get really good results out of it. The one thing that I take away from going through the design thinking process is really how to make your product very elegant. I think that this week is helping me a lot to think about the process we are going through. I think there is a lot of reflection that I will take back with me. It's been like one of the better experiences of my life. This has been great and I think it's going to be great for the development of our show. And here they are on the other side. And, you know, but really, the journey is just beginning for them. And tonight, they are going to just give you an introduction to all their great work. But before all that, I just want to give you a few notes. This is being recorded for friends and family who weren't able to be here tonight. And if you can, if you would, we would love it if you would tweet tonight out using the hashtag podcreator. Tweet about how excited you are. Tweet about the fact that you're crying. Tweet about the fact that you fell in love and then fell in love again and then fell in love again. Do all those things. That's hashtag pod creator. And if you like what you hear, and I know you're going to, make sure to subscribe to all these shows. I already have. They are fantastic. You are going to love everything you hear tonight. And now, one other thing I do want to warn you. I do have a thick Minnesota accent, according to some people. So apologies in advance if there are certain words that I pronounce. Oh, gosh, you know. I mean, I can't even think of a real word there that's going to get wrong there. But, you know, anywho, there are certain words that may come out wrong. So I will do my best to pronounce everybody's names right and uh, pronounce all the shows correctly. But I'm just giving you a little heads up in advance. All right, with all that out of the way, let's get this show started with our first team. Have you ever thought about what it takes to feel free? City of Women comes to you all the way from Bangalore, India, where hosts Radhika Vishwanathan and Samyukta Varma explore the many calculated strategies, backdoor negotiations, and sometimes absurd lengths that women go to to have fun and feel free in their own city. It's not impossible, it's just complicated. Please join me in welcoming City of Women. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Samyukta. I'm Radhika. And we're going to start with, as all Indians uh, will uh, tend to do, with an old story, the Ramayana, perhaps one of India's most famous ancient uh, epics. And never mind if you haven't heard of it, because we're going to tell you the short version. It's a very, very simple story about a noble prince called Rama, who through a twist of fate and a pretty deceitful stepmother was exiled to a forest for 14 long years. 
and his dutiful wife Sita followed him. Yeah. No, no, and he went. And Sita said, if you go, I go. No, Sita. The forest is beset by Rakshasa demons. They harass our wise men and desecrate their ritual fires. I must fight them. Alone. But Rama, a woman's place is next to her husband. I will accept any hardship. I cannot live without you. I cannot live without you. I cannot live without you. I cannot. <laughs> so as you can see, Sita is the epitome of the Indian woman. And who wouldn't want to be her? I mean, she's dutiful, she's obedient, she's beautiful, and she's very, very, very kind. So um, in the forest, life carries on as one would expect. It's hot, there are animals, and there are long periods of time when Sita finds herself left alone, when Rama and his brother Lakshmana go out to hunt and do manly things. <laughs> but because the forest was dangerous, as forests tend to be, Lakshmana came up with a pretty ingenious idea. He drew a magical circle around the house, which protected everything inside it, including Sita. So what would happen if Sita crossed the line and went out? If Sita left the circle, terrible things would happen. And for her, they did. She ended up being kidnapped, lured out of the circle, and kidnapped by a ten-headed king who took her to Sri Lanka, which then unleashed the worst war imaginable at the time, where even the monkeys came out to fight. All because she crossed the line. It was all her fault, of course. So the circle that was drawn around Sita has a name. It's called the Lakshman Rekha. Um, and even today in India, we use this phrase to talk about lines that protect us and keep evil out. For example, it's also the name of a very famous cockroach-killing poison. <laughs> so basically today, even today, for women and for cockroaches in India, there are <laughs> dire consequences, dire, dire consequences if you cross the line. Okay, so we're done with the history lesson. And now we're going to take you to our very modern city, Bangalore. <laughs> Welcome to Bangalore. It's chaotic. It's busy, it's famous for potholes and crazy traffic, and for stealing tech jobs from other countries. It's a very big city, and it's bursting with people, and often, I mean, even to me, it feels like you can lose yourself in it. And this is what it sounds like. But it's not all bad, of course. There are beautiful pockets with parks full of rain trees and flower markets. And the slender loris, which is somehow indigenous to our city. But for women, the circle still exists. And every woman will tell you about the rules of going out. And we have these rules because we still live in a culture where women have to prove that they have legitimate reasons to be out. So even before you leave the house, you probably hear things like, you want to go out and hang out with your friends? Why are you going so far away? How will we reach you? What if someone recognizes you? Will we have to come and pick you up? You're going to wear that? It's not good. I'll tell you what to wear. Because good girls don't loiter. And we know this tone so well. A couple of months ago, there was a video that went viral of a man who had something to say to a woman who went out in the evening wearing a pair of shorts. Please wear the proper dress code of India. So this is an improper dress code yes. that she's wearing. Yes. I'm so absolutely telling. Please walk a properly dress code for Indians. In India, we call this moral policing. And as an Indian woman out in the world, you always have to be prepared for someone telling you how respectable women ought to dress and behave. Over time, the litany of these reprimands adds up. And it can get dark when it feels like this feedback is constant and things you hear in the past reappear as reminders. It can feel like you're bearing the weight of the risk all on your own. And the violence, because sometimes there is violence, can feel casual and socially sanctioned. We asked some of our friends how this makes them feel. 
It's, it's like so much stress and overthinking. Eventually, every time I walked on Brigade Road, somebody would hold my, like, touch me somewhere inappropriately. Like when someone tells me that you cannot be here, you cannot do this. So that's when he got out of the car and then he tried to like hit me. What am I afraid of? First of all, traffic. It's like it's like my rights are being taken away from me or something. Second of all, like the views of people that we've been through. I don't like to be constricted in what in what I want to do. I want to grow and explore and expand. But it is stress. It's just some kind of being a woman stress. It sounds bad, doesn't it? but this is how we deal with it. Inside the brain of every woman, big calculations are continuously being made. Because you've got to prepare. You've got to prepare to be stared at by strangers. You've got to prepare to lie or have an alibi if you want to go out at night. You've got to prepare to de-escalate situations and always stay invisible. It can feel like we have to perform heroic mental acrobatics to figure out how to do even the smallest thing. Because to feel free, you have to simultaneously reject everything you've been taught about how to behave, grow the courage to do things differently, and come up with a way to do it without being caught. That said, we've also worked the system to our advantage. We have cried when we've needed to, when we've been caught by the police for speeding, and we have shamed others in a way that only women can. But the point is, the larger point is that all of this takes a lot of hard work. I mean, just look at all these rules. I know I've done many of these. Um, I've had a fake name. I've always had an alibi handy. But what we want to know is, how do other women in our city do it? What are each of their absurd strategies? How do they prepare to leave their homes go to work, sneak off to have fun, or avoid a dangerous situation? Whom did they have to negotiate with for their freedom? And when the bad stuff happens, the harassment and the violence, we really want to know how they deal with it. Wait, so what are the rules for men in Bangalore? You're probably wondering if there are any rules at all for the men in Bangalore. <laughs> Brush your teeth? Um, we're just kidding. There are no rules for men in Bangalore. You basically get to do whatever you want. You can go anywhere, sit anywhere, go for walks in the middle of the night, stare at anything you want to stare at. But women want to have fun and feel free too. It's not impossible. It's just complicated. And that's what City of Women is really about. It's about how these women have fun and feel free in their own city. You'll hear things seldom heard before. Like what it sounds like when women wander around a city with abandon, take up spaces on benches to read books and eat peanuts, or take naps in the park, or dress however they want and strut down a street and show how all of these things are perfectly legitimate reasons to leave the circle. Let's hear it again for City of Women. Yes. I can hardly wait to listen to that show. I mean, it does something that podcasting does so well when it's done well, which is it takes the personal and it makes it something so much bigger. And it takes something that's so much bigger and it makes it personal. So that's City of Women. And now our next podcast is De Eso No Se Habla. It is in translation. We don't talk about that. It's a, narrative, it's a narrative nonfiction show about silences and about how we break them. The team comes from Spain and consists of Isabel Cadenas Cañón, a writer and audio producer, and Laura Casillas, a poet and journalist. As Isabel will explain, the title of her show has a lot to do with the recent history in her country. Her show is intimate, poetic, and I warn you, a show that, it's a show that also wants to stir your own silences. Think about that. So take a deep breath because here we go. Welcome Isabel and Laura.
see that sometimes all your producers can be really annoying. We ask you to turn off your phone. <laughs> we can even turn off your fridge. <laughs> and when everybody has left, we remain there quiet and still, recording the silence of the room. That silence, we call it room tone. And we use it later in the process of editing so that silences sound more real and more natural. When I started to think about this podcast, I asked some of my friends to send me some of their room tones. This one is from Joaquin in Ushuaia. This one is from Fede here in Boston. And this one is mine, after an interview in Guadalajara. Listening to so many room tones together made me think of several things. One is that all silences are kind of similar. And another is that not two silences are the same. Maybe that's why there's another wo word we use for room tone. We call it presence. And suddenly it seemed to me that that was the best way to explain this podcast, that our silences are full of presences. This is De Eso No Se Habla, or We Don't Talk About That, a show on silences and on how we break them. For the past five months, I've been sharing the concept behind our show here in the US. And I began to realize that the meaning of silences and of the presences behind it is anything but universal. In this part of the world, when I say that I work on silences, people normally talk to me about taboos. In the part of the world where I come from, silence has a weight of its own, a historical weight, I'd say. This man is General Francisco Franco, right after winning the civil war that took place in Spain between 1936 and 1939. Franco and other generals had organized a coup d'etat against a democratically elected government that, for instance, had women vote for the first time and had recognized the right to divorce. The war lasted three years. It was cruel, and it was also a reflection of what was going on in Europe. Some said it was the last opportunity we had to stop fascism before the Second World War. And so understood it many foreigners who can fight in favor of democracy. Among them, 10,000 Americans. But we lost the war. And you know what came next in, in the world. In Spain, what came next were 40 years of a dictatorship led by that man you've seen. And I've actually spared you the sound, but I'd really like you to listen to his voice, if only to appreciate the deep contrast between his authoritarian regime and his meager voice. And thanks to all those who hear this word to speak them all over the world. Country, religion, family. This is our aim and dream. Viva España. It's kind of funny, but it's also devastating. Those final words of his speech, country, religion, family, were the umbrella under which his regime committed a purge of what they considered the enemies of the state. Intellectuals, Freemasons, left-wingers, Protestants, you name it. Anybody could be an enemy of the state. Like a shop owner who dared to defend a public non-religious school in his village. Or a teacher who was banned from teaching because I quote, um, she has the abilities necessary for the position, but she's not a trustworthy person for the new Spanish state. Or a woman who was too free to be a woman. These people were not soldiers. They did not fight a war. They were civilians. And they had often been denounced by their neighbors because they were suspect of thinking differently from that family, religion, country mantra. Then most of them were thrown into mass graves that to this day pierce our country. This is called social cleansing. And it's also called white terror. like white noise. White noise is an aleatory signal in which all frequencies have the same intensity, 
none of them is higher than the other. In Spain, under Francoism, our parents and grandparents learned the hard way that Merkel Yosef noted was oftentimes dangerous. If you did, people could know what you thought. And if they did, they could denounce you. And if you were denounced, they could take away your home, or you could be imprisoned, or you could be killed. In Spain, under Francoism, our parents and grandparents learned to be white noise. And this is when some of these sentences were born. No te signifiques, or don't signify yourself, don't make yourself noted, but also, literally, don't mean anything, be meaningless. No remuevas la herida, or don't stir the wound, or even if it hurts, just let it be. And de eso no se habla, or we don't talk about that. That's how they learned to be silent. But of course, that's in the past. Some people say, and you might say, and it's true that Franco did die in 1975. And afterwards, Spain underwent a process known as la transición, or the transition to democracy. In this process, most political forces decided that in order to attain democracy, we had to put the past in the past and just look forward. This process was called el pacto de silencio, or the pact of silence. And it's been extremely successful. Most of us was, were brought up with the same sentences that our parents and grandparents were brought up with. This is my dad, Godo. ¿Tú te acuerdas alguna vez de pequeña que me dijeras algo parecido a no te signifiques? Eh, con esa expresión, no, porque no es mi expresión, no te signifiques. Eh. Que, que no seas de cabecilla de nada, eh, que vayas. Eh, eh, más de, de, de sin, sin ir con la ropa de domingo siempre, que vayas tranquilita, porque no vayas en primera línea, porque si hay palos, esa es la primera que vas a recibir. Estas cosas. This is my friend Fanny. Yo siempre pienso en una cosa que hacía mi abuela cuando íbamos a, a verla al pueblo y éramos pequeñas, eh, cuando nos daba comida, jamón, queso, lomo, eh, huevos, frutos secos, lo que fuese, eh, lo metía siempre en, en varias bolsas y la última era una bolsa verde, opaca, y lo hacía intencionadamente para que no se viese que era lo que llevábamos en esa bolsa. ¿no? Muchas veces las propias vecinas o primas le habían dado algunas de esas cosas, pero ya no quería que al salir de casa pudiesen ver que era lo que llevábamos en la bolsa para evitar el, el comentario. ¿no? ¿Qué van a decir? And this is my friend Emilio. Cuando mi abuela escuchaba a sus hijos, a mi padre y a sus hermanos hablando del pasado y recordando cosas de cuando era pequeño, y ella intuía que en algún momento podían hablar de su padre. Mi abuela pegaba un golpe en la mesa, en la cocina, se hacía un silencio y tardaban unos segundos en cambiar de conversación, ¿no? Porque ahí había un territorio del que no se podía hablar. In the country where I come from, silences aren't born out of taboos. They're born out of fear, inherited fear. And that's why some of us become diggers. My friend Emilio had heard his grandfather's story over and over again at his house. Um, he was actually the shop owner you've seen in the first picture. He was killed, and then he was thrown into a mass grave with other 13 people. In the year 2000, Emilio was the first person in Spain to locate the body of a disappeared person, exhume it, and then have it identified via DNA test. And then after him, many, many people followed through. Some of us dig in the literal sense by breaking up the earth, and then some of us dig in a more literal sense, or in a more metaphorical sense. But we're all trying to break some silences. My mother died when I was eight years old, and she had been sick, but her death happened suddenly. No one expected it. When I became an adult, I began to realize that I had no reasons that explained my mother's death. And when I began to ask around, my family and my mother's friends tried to dissuade me. Why did I want to know? It could hurt me. And it's not that they were trying to hide anything from me. 
Actually, them themselves, they didn't really know. This is my sister, Blanca. Claro que me faltan datos, claro que me, hay fichas o piezas que me faltan, pero sí, he aprendido a... He aprendido, me he acostumbrado a, a saltar esas partes, esas, esas fichas que faltan, pues salto y ya está, me voy a la siguiente, ya está. Y me he montado yo la historia, rellenando yo a mi forma los huecos y ya está. ¿Sí? Y a mí, por ejemplo, cuando hemos hablado siempre de mamá, cuando tú me has preguntado, yo estaba tranquila, digo, chica, pues no sé por qué no te cuadra, pues se murió y se murió. Y sí, sí que es verdad que tenemos eso muy metido, lo de, bueno, ya está, así, así está bien, ya está. No se sabe, no se sabe, punto. No, ese punto. Not knowing is a habit we've so deeply made our own. And the truth is that me, myself, I didn't insist much in breaking it. This cassette has been in my house forever. It's from when I was five years old. And I know, of course, because I wrote my name and my age on it with the shaky handwriting of a girl that's learning to write. In it, my sister and I play to be radio hosts. And at some points during our broadcasts, my mother's voice just jumps in. And I actually don't know why I knew this, because last time I listened to it was probably 20 years ago. I didn't dare to listen again. A friend of mine told me recently about a syndrome called el síndrome del hijo, or the daughter syndrome. She says that when your parents have died at a young age, um, you dread getting to that age. And then when you finally get to that age, you finally dare to do things you didn't dare to do before. My mom died when she was 38 years old, and I'll be 38 in three months. This is uh, the origin of the Sono Se Habla, a show that connects the dots between the personal and the collective silences, and a show that tries to break them. Muchísimo calor del que tenemos hoy en todo Euskadi. Vamos a recordar que las temperaturas. En Bilbao tenemos 34 grados de calor, es la temperatura... Keep it going for De Eso No Se Habla. I warned you that you would cry tonight. I warned you. Don't say I didn't warn you. So beautiful. No, eso, De Eso No Se Habla. All right. We're now going to travel all the way to, to Beirut, Lebanon. We have Rhea Hadid and Afif Nesui host, um, hosting their new revolutionary podcast called Her Stage. It's a show about femme activists flipping the Arab patriarchy on its head. And tonight, the two of them are going to share their personal stories and how stories like theirs, often silenced and suppressed in the Arab world, are shaping a new revolution. Give it up for Rhea and Afif. When you allow yourself to exist as you are in this fucked up world, it's a form of resistance. 
بيروت لبنان بيروت لبنان منتك الوضع شو بدي اقول لك يعني انه اي ريفولوشن كل شيء ريفولوشن واتس ماي بارت اوف ات سبيك Lebanon is in the grip of unprecedented protests. 1.5 million people, that is a quarter of the population, have taken to the streets to call for political and economic reform. So my parents tell me this sentence every week. Listen, I love my parents, they're very loving people, but like all Lebanese parents, they love to criticize, or as my mom likes to say, give constructive feedback. So no big surprise, I grew up with major body image issues. I w- only thought that I could date until I lost the weight. I'm a person who can see his face. When I came to the cuisine, it was at the time overweight. I told you that I regret that I had a lot of things that I did because I was ashamed of my body and I felt that I had a lot of things. My sister, she's one of my favorite faces. <laughs> she has like a really nice big nose. ماتو ثيرابي طلب مني بنسي غمضي عينيك وتشخصي حالك عم تمشي شو عم بتشوف اول مره شفت حالي بس من ورا بس ظهري امي كان دلت الا انه بليز اعملي من خارك وظبطي و اتس نوت فيمينين انف ماي بيست فريند ناجا هاز بين تراين تو جيت مي اوفر ماي انسيكيورتيز سو شيز جيفين مي ا ميجرابل جول تو اتشيف اوفر ا سبيسيفيك بيريد اوف تايم اور فور يو ماركتينج هيدز ا كي بي اي Uh, two dates a month. Uh, so I'm gonna go through quickly the first month of this endeavor. So date number one, Hassan. Met him on Tinder, he owns his own startup, likes to take long walks, is a self-proclaimed feminist. I'm like, great, man of my dreams. Uh, but when I pulled into the Starbucks where we we're gonna have our date, he texts me this, basically saying, sorry if I don't shake your hand, don't get offended, but with Ramadan coming up, I'm trying to make things right with God. You know what's not great for someone who has body image issues? Going out on a date with someone who thinks it a sin to even touch her. So on to date number two. <laughs> Roland, also a Tinder match, uh, super sweet and engaging via text. But during our date, he kept looking to his phone to use our text conversations as our date conversations. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> so At one point, he goes to a text that I had sent him saying how much I loved Handmaid's Tale and was reading Bad Feminist by Roxanne Gay. And his very sexy response to that was, don't tell me you're one of those feminists. The date was over. <laughs> Listen, my experience is pretty universal. But what I've come to realize is that there's a rule book on how to be a good Lebanese woman. This is how you need to act. This is how you need to think. And this is how you need to look. Because the patriarchy owns our bodies. Imagine, up until 2017, if a woman got raped, her rapist could just marry her to get off scot-free. A law that was abolished thanks to the hard work of a group of amazingly brave women only two years ago. The abolishment of this law is one of the many examples of women taking that rule book and throwing it right out the window. صرت انه اول ما انزل على البحر بدي اكون اول وحده عم بشلح، في عندي كرش ويولو انه بدي احب البحر وكرشي بيروح يمين وشمال انا عم بلعب تنس. I was the first journalist to like break a story about sexual abuse in the Lebanese church. اجاني كثير تهديدات على فيسبوك، حتى عائلتي انا وقفوا ضدي. It doesn't stop me. في واحد قال لي شو بدك بالارهاب؟ روحي اطبخي، قلت له يا اخي ما بعرف اطبخ. يا اخي ما بقى بحرق. طلعت بفكرة بنت آه عم تترك بيتها لأنه بدها تكون حرة. So I moved out of my parents' house and it was a huge problem. كنت ضلني اسمع من أهلي إنه شو رح يقولوا العالم؟ شو بدنا نقول لعائلتي؟ بس I did it anyway. إنه إيه بدنا نشيل الكرش يعني بس إنه أوكي بدنا نغير البلد as well. So while all this is happening, was happening, I went to a coffee shop with my friend Afif Nusuli, who's a Lebanese American journalist, to kind of like update each other on our lives. And he was telling me about this story he was working on about two sister social workers who were going into Lebanese prisons. And I told him about a show I had just watched where this comedian got up on stage and completely owned her sexuality, her body, her mental health, and destroyed the Lebanese political system all in one hour. I'd never seen anything like it in Lebanon. It was revolutionary. So we decided to make this podcast. And then a literal revolution erupted. Uh, and women were at the front lines of this revolution. 
uh, it's actually pretty ironic. Women are using the very bodies that the patriarchy shames as a weapon at these revolutions. You know that old saying, we don't hit girls? Well, women are using that to keep the peace between protesters and the army. Um, a lot of people call this revolution the October 17th revolution, but we like to say that el thawra untha, or the revolution is female. Mothers, daughters, doctors, teachers, students, dreamers, and organizers. A couple of Sundays ago, I was at the protest with my mom, and we wanted to close down a major highway to send a message to the government. And one side of the highways was closed, but the other side needed closing as well, so we needed bodies to run to the other side. So I got all excited, got up, ran, sat in the middle of the road, and we were successful that day. We closed down the highway. When the excitement died down, I looked to my right, and there was my mom, my 54-year-old mother, the same woman who said, we were both there together, fighting with our round bodies. Now, don't get it twisted. When I told my mom that I was going to come here today and talk to all of you guys, she said, you better suck in your stomach when you're on stage. <laughs> But I'll never forget that moment, because women are finally stepping into their power and being celebrated for it. And I've learned over time to lean into my own power and encourage every single one of my sisters to do the same, because we women have a lot more to gain, other than weight, from being completely ourselves. So I took this footage just a few days ago, about a week ago now. It's pretty horrifying. Um, but as you see, women were really at the front end using their bodies to keep things peaceful. It was incredible to watch. My name is Afif Nasuli. I'm a journalist. I have spent the last few weeks, months, documenting the revolution in Beirut. I'm Muslim. I'm Lebanese. I'm also a southern boy from Georgia who did things like play soccer. It's just that when I would play soccer, my Arab dad would run up and down the field with his pipe in his mouth, smoking, but also screaming, Yalla ya Habibi, shoot! <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't the only big personality in my household. I had powerful women in my life when I was growing up, too. But when I was 23, my mom got sick. Uh, she eventually died of cancer. The grief and the survivor's guilt was so much to handle. So much so that I decided to leave Atlanta, escape it, and go to Beirut for the summer. And that is when I ended up in prison. So for context, the reason I got jailed is because I went to Israel. As a Lebanese citizen, that is a big no-no. That is not, that is, that is basically the biggest no-no you can do. Basically, I went to the West Bank in Palestine with a research group, but as I said, in the blink of an eye, I was sent to jail, and I was considered an enemy of the state, a spy for the CIA. My first thought was, holy shit, I'm going to be here forever. In hindsight, I was only there for a couple days. But while in jail, there's no concept of time, right? There's no clocks, there's no sunlight in a lot of instances, in mine at least. I was put in a cell with 10 different people after being cuffed and blindfolded and interrogated. I was with migrant children, I was with extremists, I was with violent criminals. Some of them bloodied, some as young as 12, in prison who hadn't been tried at all. It was horrible. And even though I just spent about two days there, it changed me forever. I couldn't unsee or unknow what I'd experienced. I felt like I could understand how radicalism could thrive in these cells. Three things happened next which may not seem related to this experience, but I know that they are. Number one, I came out of the closet and owned being a gay man. This is me in a wig. <laughs> Wigs are tight, right? Yeah. Um, for the first time in what seemed like 10 years or so, I felt like I belonged, that life had a point, that, that I had a space. I realized that I was a gay, and it was a big deal. The second thing is that I left my job at The Daily Show, I was a producer there, and I officially moved back to Lebanon and decided to live with this crazy 70-year-old Baba you see up here. I love to Instagram him, he loves to cuss me out. <laughs> He's the quintessential 
masculine Arab man, right? He's the type of guy who smokes a pipe on a Georgia soccer field screaming, like no shame. And yet, despite all of this, we cried hysterically on Independence Day just, a, just about a week ago, and that was in Beirut. It was the first time we'd shared tears since my mom died. The third thing that happened is that I feel like I became a journalist, a real journalist, one that was focusing on stories about revolutionary changes in Lebanon. As I delved deeper into reporting on these changes in Lebanon, I began to feel changes in my own personal life, right? I began to understand how my culture and my queerness could interact. I searched for the gay stories in Lebanon, and I uncovered a hidden community of drag queens, and they were fierce. Um, they were boldly putting on elaborate runways and lip syncs, they were voguing, and it was inherently political, right? What they were doing was incredibly um, inconsistent with Lebanese mores. Inside the venues, which were completely protected by bodyguards and hidden away at secret locations, it kind of felt like New York City. People were partying, they were holding hands, they felt free. But just outside the venue, we couldn't even hold our date's hands. Ladies and gentlemen, and all those in between, welcome to the Beirut Grand Park. There were people under the وكثير هول اللي بيتجمعوا بعد ما يسكروا المحلات اللي بيشربوا بيره بيقعدوا على السياره هيك فكنت جاي من شو نزلت وحافيه مع الفول اوتفيت وحامل الهيلز بايدي ورقت من حدهم قام هيك انه صاروا يتطلعوا انه بدهم يعرفوا شب او بنت شو هيدا الشيء قام انا مكيف فيهم لانه كان كثير نظراتهم مزعجين شلت الوج ومسكتها بايدي وبقيت ماشي ايفنتس مثل هول اللي بنعملهم هون we are making history. So my queerness for me was a superpower that got me out of my darkness. My mom's death, prison. I needed clarity bad. And my queerness kind of gave me a piece of myself back. But what really struck me when I was in these sort of parties and in this community of activism is that these Arab drag queens were using their queerness to spark revolution. They were not wallowing in self-pity or victimhood or fear, and it was inspiring. Soon, Rhea and I realized that the femme characters of our country were many in number and diverse in story. Each deserved a stage to sing from. The revolution, to feel safety, starts on the inside of a human being. Now the femme activists we'd been covering for a year have become, before our very ears, literal revolutionaries in themselves. The October 17th revolution in Lebanon has become a forum for all of us to scream. Like we've said, we're not here to cover it in a newsy sort of way, but our podcast is about covering untold stories so we can fight for the prosperity of all of us, no matter who we are. It happens that this revolution has emp empowered a lot of us to finally use the voice and power we've got. So, using this stage right here is how we're going to do it. We want to show you how her stage is set. Slowly and surely, the stage is changing. Her stage is a podcast about an ensemble cast of characters who are changing social norms in Lebanon. Comedians and playwrights. Drag queens and chefs. Social workers and journalists. Artists and storytellers. We bring you change makers. The change comes from simply being ourselves. The characters and the, their work that we've podcasted are Arab, are feminine, are a revolution in themselves. Because the Middle East is not behind or backwards. It's time for a new story, a true one. A story that shows that we're not really that alone. We can protect each other, express ourselves, build a new world, and prosper. And why did I say this podcast? Because stand-up is also somehow the same. Telling the story that we wished someone told us. And I, I, if I were that the person who was 15 and afraid of it, he is now who I am. This is her stage, our stage, our revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Keep that applause going for her stage. That is such a powerful message, and it's really. Not just true of their podcast, 
but of all great storytelling, the power of how a voice can be something so much bigger, it can be revolutionary. Uh, I hope you all subscribe to that and to all the shows that we heard during the first half of tonight. Uh, and now, of course, it's that magic intermission time and where you can get a drink and get ready to feel all of the excitement to laugh and cry and fall in love some more during the second half of our show. Uh, but before we get to the intermission, I just want to tell you something about the drinks we have tonight. We have three specialty drinks for you. The Rose, the Thorn, and the Bud, all inspired by a core part of this program, feedback. Now, these six teams have gotten a lot of feedback. At PRX, they do feedback using a system called Rose, Thorn, or Bud, or I Like, I Wish, or What If. So the Rose cocktails, they're a little sweet. They're the positives. The Bud cocktails, they're fresh and full of possibilities. And the Thorns, well, I'll just say if you like whiskey, you're going to love the Thorns. I love whiskey. You're going to love that. They're all delicious, though. So grab a drink. Be sure to tip your bartender. Take a bathroom break. And we'll see you back here in 15 minutes.
the winner tonight. So were they good? I hope you guys all are enjoying your drinks. I hope you enjoyed your intermission. And um, those last three shows were obviously totally incredible. We have three more podcasts to present to you shortly. But before we get to the next three, which will blow your mind, I first want to introduce you to Mark Pagan, the program manager for the Google Podcast Creator Program. Yes, everyone should be clapping and cheering. Mark is incredible, and he has a few words to share with you. Mark? Hi, guys. Um, that's really nice. I, I paid a lot of people to hoot for me. Um, I'm, I'm very curious here because there are some people who hooted that I do know, but who do I not know? And I mean that in a way that's like, who is here because they saw it advertised or maybe a friend brought them, but aren't from PRX. Uh, why don't you hoot as well? That's really awesome. That's, that's so great that you guys are here. I'm, this is a portion of the evening that we're gonna talk a little bit about the program. We're not gonna bore you. We're gonna show you some fun stuff in a second. Um, so uh, uh, like Kristen said, I'm with PRX and the project manager for the Google Podcast Creator Program. But I actually wanna bring somebody else on stage with me to talk about uh, the initiation of the program. And I'm gonna ask uh, Zach renaud Wedeen from uh, Google Podcast to come join me on stage, please. And Zach, I'm actually going to give you this mic, and if you can tell us a little bit about uh, how the program started and how in the world we met. And Sounds good. Uh, yeah, so I'm supposed to tell you why we started this program, but it's very self-evident after the first three acts, uh, so you guys probably get it already. We launched the Google Podcast app about a year and a half ago in 2018, and the reason we got into podcasting at all is because we noticed over particularly the last five years an explosion in the number, variety, and quality of podcasts out there. And it reminded us a little bit of like the web in like 1996, where you, if you're old enough to remember, uh, I am, I am, uh, <laughs> you would go to like yahoo.com and it would be an alphabetical list of all the websites you might want to visit. And that's actually why they called it Amazon, was because it would be at the top. Um, and that's kind of how podcasts were five years ago. But now, there are tons of podcasts. There are actually over 2 million podcasts indexed every day by Google Podcasts. And not all of us have these shows to go to for discovery. And Google, back in the 90s and in the early 2000s, really helped simplify the web and help you find new things. And so that's why we decided to get involved from a product perspective. But being Google, as we were building the Google Podcasts app, we didn't want to just release it for you know the Silicon Valley or like California. We wanted to be accessible to people all around the world from all different backgrounds and help double worldwide podcast listening to two, three hundred, four hundred million people and eventually over a billion people listening to podcasts. So as we were building this app, we realized that we were talking about how podcasts are for everyone, but on the creation side, there was an imbalance in terms of who was making podcasts. Overwhelmingly in the US, the top charts were filled with uh, less than 25% women and even fewer people of color. And so we wanted to figure out why that was and help set an example throughout the industry that this is actually an inefficient way to approach this business when we expect a huge explosion on the audience side around the world. Uh, so we dreamt up the Google Podcast Creator Program, which we announced on the same day as our original app launch, the first day that this brand existed at all, so did the Creator Program. And it has three key pillars. Uh, empower underrepresented voices, showcase their work to inspire the industry, and educate people around the world to get into podcasting and remove those barriers. And so the creator program, uh, we vetted a bunch of companies and ended up teaming up with PRX, who I think you can tell have done an amazing job. We're so thankful to be able to work with Mark and Carrie and Carrie and Lindsay and the whole team at PRX and are excited uh, for the future as well, uh, and then showcasing their work here today, uh, but also using some of Google's reach in order to help the word get out. And the final pillar, which I think you're about to see a little snippet of, is educate. And our first foray in that direction is the podcasting 101 videos. Um, you know, these six groups are very lucky to be here um, and also very skilled to be here. They all earned it. 
Uh, but over 10,000 people applied to be in the Google Podcast Creator Program. So I know we have some people here from HBS. Uh, that's about 100 times lower acceptance rate than HBS. <laughs> Um, so these are, these are really distinguished folks that we have here, but we really want to stay engaged with the 9,988 folks that applied and weren't necessarily accepted, but easily could have been. Um, and so that's what this Educate Pillar is about, is introducing people, even if you're not part of the program, but having these people stand as an example for them and giving them access to help everyone start a podcast, because we don't think there can be too many podcasts, if, especially if Google's here to help you find the one that's perfect for you. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. So Zach gave the perfect segue here. Uh, just last month, we released uh, 10 series, 10 part series of Podcasting 101. These are free tools that are available to anybody in the world. They're translated into five languages. And you are going to see the first episode right now. Don't worry, it's not like an hour-long episode. These are short, but they tell you, they teach you everything from starting to podcast to recording to making your show sustainable. And uh, let's take a look at the first, uh, the first episode. Uh, also, these, uh, this video series is hosted by Sean Ramos Farm of Today Explained and Lovey Ajayi, who are delightful and engaging and lovely and uh, just so many things. All right, play the video so I stop talking. Hello, is this thing on? It is now. Yo! Lovey Ajayi! Sean Ramos for what's going on? Professional troublemaker, best-selling author, host of the Rants and Randomness podcast, yes. co-host of the Jesus and Jolliffe podcast? Yes, and Sheesh. Sean! Rider of bikes, notorious True. recycler, True. Sri Lankan, Canadian American, Do it come all. on, global citizen, yes. and host of Vox's Today Explained podcast. She read my bio. I did, I'm impressed. Mm. So it's a great time to talk about making podcasts right now. It's like the wild, wild west of podcasts right now. Yeah. A couple years ago, 10 years ago or so, they're just a novelty, and now it's like the most exciting time in the history of humanity History. to work in audio. Yeah, and anyone and everyone can start a podcast. There are no gatekeepers. It's truly democratic and international medium. You might be totally new to making things, or you might already be sharing your passion projects on sites like SoundCloud or YouTube, but should you make a podcast? And if you think the answer is yes, We've got 10 videos for you right now. Google Podcasts and PRX, they teamed up to create the Google Podcast Creator Program and bring you these dope videos, which will help you learn what you need to make your podcast dream a reality. As your hosts, Lovey and I will be here to guide you from like your kernel of an idea all the way to podcast superstardom, we hope. So think about it. You wanna ask yourself some hard questions to get to your why. Why does this story need to be told? And why are you the person to tell it? And given how many podcasts are already out there, why is your show a must listen? Yeah, think about my podcast, Rants and Randomness. My why is that I want to talk about the world as I see it, drive meaningful conversation, and elevate voices, particularly marginalized voices that I find interesting. Some you may already know, others you may not. For me, everyone's ordinary is kind of extraordinary. You're the only person talking about your experience the way you're talking about it. And even though my daily news show is really different from yours, yeah. what sets us apart is that we're not trying to be the all-knowing news authority out there. Our whole thing at Today Explained is we think it's important to understand the news, and we're here trying to figure it out right next to you. Yeah, and once you figure out your why, let's go a little deeper and think about the who you're making this for. Ask yourself, what is your podcast about, really about? A simple way to test this is to work out a kind of Mad Libs focus statement for your show, something like this. My show's about blank, and on it you'll hear blank, and you should listen if you are blank. Sean, you wanna give it a go? I think I can do this for sure. Yeah. We actually had to do this when we were launching my show Today Explained. The show's about explaining the news. The news comes at you fast, and we'll help you understand it at the end of the day. And on it you'll hear a 20 minute explanation of one of the most important news stories in the world. And you should listen if you're the type of person who gets like a news notification on your phone and you go like, wait, what? Nice. All right, let me try for rant and randomness. Okay. The show is about all things pop culture, and on it, you'll hear my most pressing rants, raves, and faves in this topsy-turvy world. And you should listen if you're somebody who wants to be their best self and loves real talk. Nice. And you know what's great? Podcasting is such an intimate medium. 
When you reach that listener you have in mind, there's a good chance they'll feel super connected, like they know you. Yeah, after all, they're listening to you when they're on their way to work, taking the bus, cleaning the house. It's a deep connection, the best. The best, and that's why it's so critical in podcasting where listeners have to seek out your show to have a really good sense of your audience. All right, so you try. Make your own focus statement. My show's about, and on it you'll hear, and you should listen if you are. Try it out on your friends. Get feedback, make changes, revisit your focus statement often as you develop your show. And think about your why. Think about your who. And you're on your way. That's huge. Huge. All right, so come join me in our next episode where I'm gonna go deep on the other things you wanna be thinking about when starting your podcast. And while you're at it, visit googlecp.prx.org for more information about the Google Podcast Creator Program. All right, peace out. All right, take note of that URL there. googlecp.prx.org. All 10 are available, they are free. You do not have to pay anything, you can share them. Um, like I said, five languages, so please take a look. We're gonna get the show started, or restart in a second. I just wanted, I, I want your time just for uh, just a few quick minutes because I, I wanna talk uh, uh, about something, a little bit of nostalgia. Uh, about one year ago today, I woke up, a number of us on the training team woke up, uh, and the application window for the first cohort uh, had ended. And uh, we woke up on this morning, one year ago, to find out that we had over 6,000 applications and about two and a half weeks to find six teams. Um, we've run two application windows at this point. Uh, it's, it's been tremendous getting to know uh, not only the people that have been invited into these programs, but also podcasters all around the world. And I just want to take a, a few quick minutes. Uh, for the second cohort, we did something that we wanted to try, and we invited uh, three teams that were runner-up teams to join for the first, uh, the first week of training with uh, the teams that you're meeting tonight. And they, they're not all with us here tonight, but they gave us some quick, quick selfie videos. I just want you guys to take a quick listen and look and uh, learn about some other podcasts that you should be paying attention to. Uh, the first vi quick video is from our friend Thomas Reed in uh, Pennsylvania, and I'll have him introduce himself on the screen here. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Thomas Reed. I'm the host and producer of a podcast called Read My Mind Radio. It's where we share personal essays of people impacted by all degrees of blindness, and occasionally, I share some of my own experiences as a man adjusting to becoming blind as an adult. Now, as you can probably imagine, we're targeting people adjusting to becoming blind. However, the lessons that we share that you take away are truly universal. Now, with that said, I'd love for you to come check us out. We're available wherever you find podcasts. And you can also find me on readmymind.com. That's R-E-I-D, like my last name. Now, one other reason for you to check us out is because we make blindness sound funky. I hope that prompts you. We're going to go all the way to Oakland, California for a second, and we're going to meet the Copper and Heat team. Hey, I'm Katie Osuna, and I'm the executive producer of Copper and Heat in Oakland, California. I'm Ricardo. I'm the sound designer and producer. I'm also in Oakland. I'm Rachel. I'm the editor. And I'm in Santa Barbara. Copper and Heat is a James Beard award-winning podcast about the unspoken rules and traditions of restaurant kitchens. Currently, we're in the middle of our second season, Overhead. The business of owning a restaurant is incredibly complicated. And there are these systems in place that cooks, chefs, owners have had to learn to navigate while usually operating on these razor thin profit margins. So this season we've been exploring some of the challenges that face people that work in the restaurant industry from the wage discrepancy between cooks and waiters usually spurred on by the tipping system to the labor shortage and how immigration crackdown at the border has really scared chefs and restaurant owners to the challenges of opening a new restaurant and finding investors. We'll be releasing new episodes every two weeks from now until April so you can find us on Google Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Check out copperandheat.com for more information and to subscribe. All right. And last but not least, we want to give lots of love to Beantown. I don't even know if you guys call it Beantown. I'm going to call it Beantown. Uh, and uh, our last runner-up team uh, here in Boston, Fashina. Hi, I'm Eloisa Barbosa. And I'm Adam Gamwell. We're coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. And we are the creators of Fashina. Fashina is a Portuguese language podcast. 
and fashin is a Portuguese word that means deep cleaning. And in this podcast, we collect stories that tend to get swept under the rug. In our first season, we we'll go into the world of Brazilian house cleaners, cleaning houses in Boston, in the US, and making a living. And we're really excited. We're going to bring you the first season in early 2020. You can check us out at fashinapodcast.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter and check out an audio sample of one of our early episodes. Fashina. Fashina. We'll see you there. <laughs> And because we're local, we do have two of the members of Fashina here. If you guys just want to quickly stand up and wave. So make sure you say hi and subscribe. All right, I am going to get off the stage in a second. I want you to want to again thank all of you for coming tonight. This means so much to see you. I've been working with these teams for quite a few months now, and I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you, sharing their, experiencing their work with you. Um, and we'll keep the show going. Again, thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, Mark Pagan. All right, it's time. It's time to get on with the final three performances of the night. Next, we have Michelle James, also known as MJ, and Danielle Brown, also known as Danny from New York City. And together, these best friends started a podcast that's changing, about, changing how black women talk about cancer and wellness. But to be clear, their show isn't all doom and gloom, like your favorite happy hour or Sunday afternoon brunch with friends. There's always plenty to catch up on. There's lots of laughter. And at its core, their show is a celebration of life with those closest to us. Tonight, MJ and Danny will share three segments from their lifestyle and wellness podcast, Cocktails and Cancer. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Showcase. We made it to the showcase. We made it in the program. <laughs> we did not get kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> Lord knows. Thank God. Lord knows. How are you? It, I'm, I'm like so blessed and excited to be here you tonight. You are blessed. You look so cute. I'm like sparkly. You are shining. <laughs> shining, 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 shining. Yeah. Yes, of course. So, Sit down, grab your drink. Let's all talk. Right. <laughs> it's great to see you guys. <laughs> yes, yes. So MJ and I started this podcast um, back in, well, she announced it in, when was that, January of 2019. Yes. Um, because my good friend here is almost four years cancer-free. Four years cancer-free. <laughs> yes, thank you. Let's give it up. Um, and I think that the big thing that was kind of like um, a surprise for everyone is I kept it a secret. So for three years, I kept it a secret. Not from me. Not from, from Danny. She was along the way for the chemotherapy and the radiation. And so... Um, in December, actually this month, I go to the doctor and the doctor says, you're three years cancer free. And I'm like, oh, three years cancer free. So I started, you know, doing some reading and I learned that black women are dying at a higher incidence from breast cancer. And I'm like, that's not cool. No. So after several sleepless nights, um, I decide I'm going to go public on social media. Yeah, and she called me at like 7 o'clock in the morning, and she's like, did you see my post? And I'm like, no, it's fucking 7 o'clock. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, so the post goes, you know, I'm three years cancer-free, uh, and I'm going to launch a podcast, and I'm calling it Cocktails and Cancer. I call Danny, and I say, will you be my co-host? Yeah, because she knew it would be a great podcast with me on there. Fire. <laughs> Fire. I said yes, and here we are. And here we are. So today, we can't take you through the entire podcast, yes. but what we will do is give you a little snippet of what it sounds like. Right. And maybe one day what it looks like, because mm. maybe we'll take it to I the like big that. screen. 2020. Gail and Oprah, watch out. Yes. Here we come. Um, so, okay, so normally we start off with what we call the poor. Yes. And the reason we do the poor is because, you know, like when you go out and when you're with your friends or whoever you're with, you are drinking, what you're drinking is indicative of how you're feeling for that day. Right, right? setting the tone. Yeah, you set the tone. So, like, 
if you're me, I'm always like on some kind of diet. So I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna have too much sugar in my Weight drink. Watches. I'm just gonna have <laughs> Weight Watchers. Too many points. But today I'm drinking. Oh, yes. I'm drinking my points tonight. Yes. I was a little nervous. And Mark was up here talking for so long. He made me like <laughs> He got me my nervous, you know, my nervous yeah, energy. Normally, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm gonna get on. But then I was like, okay, he's walking off. And then he was like, and next we want to do. And I was like, I shit, Mark, I gotta pee. Like I got right. a nervous bladder. Let's get it. Anyway, yes. so um, I'm drinking tonight. Yes, I'm drinking, drinking? Um, the Bud mm. because they said that the Bud is um, fresh. Yes. And filled with possibilities. Mm. Quite like me. Endless possibilities. I'm single, fellas. Fresh. Full of please, fellas, 2020, please. <laughs> and I am drinking a margarita with Patron. Tell them why. Well, because I got the rose and I didn't like it. <laughs> and so I was like, what is this? She, went, she was like, Danny, are you sure you ordered the right like, thing? She always whiskey. doubts me. I, I ordered her drink. Thorn. She gets backstage. She drinks it. She's like, this is not a rose. I'm like, yes, the f I ordered you I a said, rose. It's supposed to be sweet. We went to the bartender. She She's said, like, yes, what's in this? Yes. And they, what happened? Shout out Tell to him the what bartender. happened. I was right. He made this so, so Yes, good. and thank I didn't you, have my wallet, you. so I didn't tip you. Cheers. I'll tip you later, babe. So cheers, Danny. Cheers. Cheers to the yes, poor. to the poor. Mm. Ah, this is so good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next on the podcast, we get into the highs and lows. Yes. And the highs and lows is probably one of my favorite segments. And it's yeah. because I get a chance to find out what's going on with Michelle. And so you know on the podcast, whatever we talk about, we don't talk about in advance. So no. we only we like are literally catching so up. You, you don't go and call your friend and say, hey, today we're gonna talk about this. Yeah, this, when this, I see you later yeah. at the brunch, we're gonna talk about blah blah blah. Right. Bring an agenda. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Take notes. So um, yeah, so we talk about the highs and lows. But since yeah. we're here with you tonight, right, we're gonna do it a little different. And tonight we're gonna talk about our highs and lows of the holiday season because it's upon us. Yes, it is. You going first? So I'll go first. I'll go first. And you know, the, the holidays are tough for a single woman. And single meaning I have someone in my oh, life. Okay. You're not married. I'm not married. And so. I'm going to go with the low first. I'm going to oh, go with the, yeah, no, I'm gonna go with the high, book. but I'm going to go with the low. So, you know, we just had Thanksgiving. And I guess, you know, my low is that, you know, family, they, they, just, they just got to say the inevitable, right? They yeah. got to say what's on their mind. Be careful, your mom mind. is watching. I know. I mean, she wasn't there. She wasn't, she wasn't there this year. So, and, you know, I'm sitting at the, at the table, and my cousins, everybody's talking about, like, engagements and all these things. And then they say, so what's up with you? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, when, you, when are y'all getting engaged? Mm, mm, mm. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't have a date on my phone. Or, like, or a I... ring on my finger. Exactly. So I'm like, Oh, I when are you getting know. engaged? When not when you're getting married. But okay. It's so much stress. Then it's like, well, what, are you going to have a baby? Like you're getting older? It's a lot of stress. Yeah, well, shit, at least drink. you got a man. Imagine the stress I'm under. It's like, <laughs> where is the man? <laughs> where are you? <laughs> So, um, okay, so that's, so that's your low. low. You know, because I, cause I gotta, you got to tell them, you should have said to them, listen, when it happens, I'll let you know. Don't ask me again. You know what? You just told them because they're all watching. <laughs> told ya. Um, and so my high, on the flip side, you know, Christmas, you know, the holiday season, Christmas. Yes. It's my favorite time love, of year. Michelle loves the holiday season. Yes, I do. She loves Christmas. Yes. And the other day she called me and she was like, have you done your holiday shopping already? And I was like, this bitch. This is what she was thinking. <laughs> what she's really think, what she was really trying to do was let me know. She's like, oh, I got your gift already. That was code for make sure you get me something because I got you something. <laughs> I mean, Be facts. Honest. Yeah. facts. No, yeah, so my high is I pulled out all my Christmas stuff. And I started decorating, so I have like the white tree, I have a treat tree, I made that up. Like a, literally a treat tree that I put treats around treats in the like kitchen. Food? Yeah, oh, and I okay. call it the treat tree. So I just make this is new? Stuff. It's new. Because I've new. never seen the treat exactly. tree. Exactly, I'm okay. about to trademark that, okay. treat tree. Um, and so my high is my mom and my sister are coming up for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited. And so I'm just doing a little extra, you know, so that you know, we're like ready for the holidays. Yeah. Yeah. So what about you? Um, those were good high and lows, James. We didn't share that with each other. So I've been anxious all day to know what her <laughs> high and lows were going to be. So normally I start off with the low. And my low, you know, I was going to go into this whole thing about how, you know, it's the holiday season and right. I'm single. But I'm tired of talking about that shit. Okay? It is what it is. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about my low tonight. Instead, mm -hmm. I am going to double up on the highs. Mm. 
Love it. Yes. So the first high is that the holiday season for me, um, the high of my holiday season normally is my family and friends. Um, I have an amazing circle. <laughs> I really do. You know, when yes. you're single, seriously, like there are some people out there that don't have anybody yes. in their lives. No. Could you imagine that? No, Could you I'm, imagine no. going through life with like no friends, no family, no. you're just lonely. And there <laughs> no. are a lot of people out there that no, that's I'm, their experience. Exactly. That is not my experience. I am blessed. Yes. I have an unbelievable circle of friends. And around the holiday times, you know, with different groups of friends, I always get together with them. And it's such a high for me. Yeah. Um, some of the girls that I went to college with, we have girls night. And it's mm -hmm. like something that we look forward to. Some of them are watching. Hey, girls. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We do girls night every holiday. So I'm super excited about that. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other high that I wanted to talk about for this holiday season is you, MJ. Oh, my goodness. What? I mean, this has been a hell of a year, and the year is coming to a, a close. Year. It's been an amazing year. It's a been year. a great ride with you. And I tell you, know, you stick with me, kid. We're going places. <laughs> Shut up and stop hitting me. <laughs> um, so, honestly, though, like, you know, we're, the year is about to come to a close, yeah. and we've spent a lot of time together. Um, yes. And this is like the season to be thankful and yes. everything. And I never forget about why this podcast came to be. Yes. You know? no, um, the fact that you had breast cancer never leaves me. You know, right, I, right. I don't forget about it. I don't. I could not be. I could not be here right you now. You could very. You better well remember, not that. Be that. <laughs> yes. remember that. I think about that. I tell you that all the time. Even when you're getting on my nerves, I'm like, thank God she's getting on yes. my nerves because it could. You, exactly. you getting on my nerves could be a memory. Exactly. But I wanted to thank you yeah. for. Um, you're welcome. Shit, let me finish. <laughs> okay, sorry. God. Sorry, go ahead. You always gotta steal the moment. Um, shit, I don't even want to say it. Oh no, come on. It's a good. It was. I mean, thank you, Michelle. Thanks for. Thank you for being a friend. Aww. Um, no, but seriously, it's been an amazing ride with you. I'm so appreciative yes. of um, the fact that you fought the fight with cancer. Yes. And I am also very appreciative of the fact that you decided to do this podcast and that you asked me to be your co-host are you gonna be there was no one else who could do the job i'm happy you know that yeah, I but she's that. looking at me every once in a while michelle looks at me like she wants to kiss me and i'm like we're not that kind of <laughs> friends like she's like her eyes get all glassy mm -hmm. and she starts but i love you she's gonna cry i love you too i love you i am very happy that we have this podcast together but more than anything i'm happy that we have this friendship and i'm oh. happy i have you i love you let's get into let's get into the quick sips okay so the quick sips it's just a little note, like Michelle and I, you know, we like quotes. We think that we're extremely inspirational <laughs> and inspiring. Yes. And we, you know, we like to drop these jewels drop the every gems. once in a while. Yeah. So we do this quick sip at the end of every episode. Mm -hmm. And it's just a word to leave you with that we think might help yeah. you out along lift your you journey up. of we're life. trying to lift you up. Yeah. Lift you up or put you on. So go ahead. What's so your I'm going to go first. I'm going to go first. So here's my quick sip. Yeah. Hold so on. Look at that picture. Part of the beauty of us being um, in the Google Podcast program yes. and having this podcast is that we got a sponsorship deal with Eloquy, a plus yes, life, a plus size clothing line. Sometimes it pays to be big girls. Um, and so those are one of the pictures that they took yes, of us. Yes, we're uh -huh. gonna use them often. <laughs> um, so here's my quick sip. Though no one can go back and make a brand new start, anyone can start from today and make a brand new ending. And I think that was so profound for tonight. Um, you know, we are trying to save lives. We're trying to, we're having conversations with women and men about the importance of, of talking about things that no one else is talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I thought, you know, we're, we, we're, we started something and who knows where it will go. Yeah, that's so. a good one, James. So what about you? So my quick sip is forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could have been any different. Mm. Mm, that's powerful. My Aunt Oprah said that. Yes, yes. Auntie you guys Oprah. are laughing. W watch and see. When you see me on Super Soul Sunday, you're going to be like, oh, shit. Exactly. Um, but anyway. And I'll be right um, there with her. I thought like, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> right there. I thought this was an excellent quote because yes. I just feel like forgiveness is such a process. And it is. I, I believe in life we need to learn to forgive one another. But yeah. we also have to learn to forgive ourselves. Yeah. So as you move forth in this holiday season, lighten up, forgive yourself, forgive others. Yes. And listen to Cocktails and Cancer. Yes. 
Often. 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 We're yeah. in season two. I'm MJ. I'm Danny. And we're bringing life to cancer. Yes. Yay, Jess. Let's hear it again for Cocktails and Cancer. Uh, Oprah Winfrey, Gail King, are you listening? Are you in the audience right now, Oprah and Gail? I'm, I'm sure they're watching from home right now and they're thinking, you know what, we're just gonna retire. We're just gonna hand over everything to the Cocktails and Cancer gals. MJ and Danny have it covered, so. Uh, great job, guys. <laughs> All right, we now have our next team, Un Periodico de Ayer. They are from Bogota, Colombia, and you are about to hear from three people named Juan Serrano, Miguel Reyes, and Daniel Diaz. They have a narrative-driven podcast. It explores the personal toll of history through great storytelling. And I'm not just talking storytelling in like a generic sense of once upon a time. It's very personal, it's intimate, it's mixing memoir, it's mixing historical fact, it's mixing document, and it's mixing memory. It is so beautiful. And through their show, they try to remind us that the past is never dead, that you can always trace invisible threads between historical events and actual human dramas. And tonight, they're bringing us something very special. It's a personal story about the legacy of important politicians inside their very own families. Please join me in welcoming Juan, Miguel, and Danielle to the stage. Hello, everyone. I am Juan. I am Miguel. I am Daniel. And we are Un Periódico de Ayer, or Yesterday's Paper. Un Periódico de Ayer is a podcast that explores how history has far-reaching repercussions on our private lives. One way in which the past is still present behind closed doors is through families and the names that bind them. Belonging to a distinguished family and carrying that family name can bring great advantages in Colombian society especially in politics. Do you see these two men? Well, both of them were presidents of Colombia. They are father and son. They even have the same name, Alfonso. Alfonso I and Alfonso II, just like in a monarchy. The same goes for these two other gentlemen, father and son too, and they both ruled Colombia. Would Misael's son have become president of Colombia had he not inherited his father's last name? Probably not. Generally, we associate these great surnames with the privileges that accompany them. But little is said about the personal burden of belonging to these families. Today, we are going to talk about that, about how what is supposedly a privilege, almost a noble title, can become a difficult way to bear. On our podcast, I'm usually a producer, but tonight I'm going to become a character and talk about my family's history and its personal legacy. Miguel belongs to an elite Colombian family. In fact, these two presidential families we just mentioned were very close to his. His family, like those, is also linked to Colombian political history. My father, Felipe Reyes de la Vega, was great-grandson of General Rafael Reyes, president of Colombia at the beginning of the 20th century. For some people, Reyes was one of the most important politicians in our history. He modernized the country, brought the first cars and railroad tracks to Colombia, and carried out expeditions to discover new territories. He was also intimidating, not afraid to use force to get what he wanted. He held public executions of those who had once tried to kill him. He left a mark on the history of Colombia and a profound legacy within my family. 
Miguel is part of a generation in which that glorious family past has been diluted. But in his father's generation, this awareness of being relatives of a former president of Colombia was still very present. I would say that my dad and my uncles gave this relationship an excessive importance. My mother, a Teresa, a Puerto Rican who settled in Colombia after she met my dad, feels the same way. Digamos que me pareció chévere todo el entorno que había de una familia política. Luego sí fui entendiendo que era una importancia demasiado agarrada de un mito y que entonces se, se perdía un poco la realidad. What my mom defines as living attached to a myth was rather something that was in the environment, a way of being in the world. In the case of my dad, that awareness of his ancestors translated into pride and sometimes arrogance. From a very young age, my dad was certain that he, had, that he was a special person full of positive attributes, and those who knew him described him that way too. He was handsome, charming, artistic, and a good sportsman. My grandmother and her aunts made him feel that, w that he was made for big things. His best friend told me this when I asked him to describe my dad. Felipe era un tipo muy, 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 muy inteligente, con muchísimo encanto personal, lleno de sentido del humor. Tenía un don especial para actuar. Él era un imitador sobresaliente. That's true. He could imitate many people, especially renowned politicians. The telephone pranks in which he impersonated them were famous in Bogotá. Recently, I found this video in which he mimics two former presidents. <laughs> Felipe Reyes was also very popular with women. This was one of his lovers when he was young. She was an Italian actress named Ornella Muti, a kind of Catherine Zeta Jones of the time. They even made a movie together. I think that conquests like this made my dad believe that there was nothing unattainable for him, that he could achieve anything he set out to do, and not only when it came to women. When he was 16, my father went to Spain to study drama. He also modeled, played in a rock band, and led a life of many excesses. But after a couple of years of living life to its limits, he decided that it was time to settle down. He returned to Colombia and enrolled in a law school in Bogota. He was an outstanding student, awarded for academic excellence, and then he became a law professor. And here, his family origin, his last name, becomes important again, because at this point he caught the political bug. This was around the mid-80s. General Reyes wasn't that well known among new generations. However, there was a place where being a great grandson of the former president immediately granted him a privileged position, the Conservative Party. Felipe Reyes started in politics in that party, which his great grandfather had led at the beginning of the 20th century. His political career took off very quickly. At 29 years old, he became one of the youngest city councillors in the history of Colombia. He was a rising star in politics. Since childhood, I heard that my dad was going to get very far in politics. Several people had told me that they expected him to become president of Colombia, like his great grandfather. Es que Felipe hubiera podido hacer cualquier cosa. Felipe hubiera podido ser un magnífico abogado. Pudiera haber sido un gran político, pudiera ser, haber sido un gran actor. A lo que lo hubiera jalado, lo habría hecho bien. But why do these people use conditional verbs whenever they talk about my dad? Why do they speak in terms of goals he did not reach? Because addiction got in the way. He had an addictive personality. 
a tendency to feel emotions in a very strong way. That led him to seek escape from reality, to seek adrenaline, and to take life to its limits, or rather, to cross those limits. For many years, Felipe Reyes prevented his addiction from affecting his political career. But in the mid-90s, he received several blows, including the death of his brother, his father, and his separation from Teresa, Miguel's mom. These events sharpened his addiction and led him to retreat from politics for several years until he asked for help. In 1998, he went to Mexico, to Mazatlán, to a rehab center. <laughs> In Mexico, it's as if he killed the version of himself, was reborn, and started a new life from scratch. By simply looking at a photo, I can tell if it was before or after Mexico. This one, for example, is on his return at my brother's high school graduation ceremony. After that, he changed his life priorities. He attended AA sessions and gave talks about addictions in schools and universities. He openly revealed his addiction and made drug prevention the center of his next political campaign. Now, he no longer wore French ties or English shoes. He moved to a smaller apartment, dedicated himself to recover what he had lost and to help others. Since I was a teenager, we talked about almost everything together. He told me about his past without mincing words. Maybe by keeping up with those illustrious last names, by being too concerned with image, my father neglected his inner self for too long. I remember one day at the dining room table when he desperately said that the worst thing his family had done when raising him was to make him believe that he was the best at everything. He could never show that something was wrong. That image, that name, and those last names, that burden of being a descendant of an important president, something so intangible, was both his blessing and his curse. I have faced my father's legacy and tried to take some distance from it, but surely there are still many hidden things that I don't see and which shape who I am today. The past is never dead. My father's story lives in mine. Caminante, son tus huellas el camino y nada más. Caminante, no hay camino. Se hace camino al andar. Al andar se hace camino y al volver la vista atrás se ve la senda que nunca se ha de volver a pisar. Caminante, no hay camino, sino estelas en la mar. Yeah, keep it going for Un Periodico de Ayer. So beautiful. Is it just me or does Ken Burns need to just step down now and hand everything over with documentary memory memoir to this team? They, they were so good. All right, it's now the time for our finale. All the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil, we have Sarah Azubel and Bia J. Maurice Marais, I'm sorry, G. Marais. Sarah is a biology PhD and Bia is a journalist and they take their recorders on the road for their show, 37 Grouse. Their show uncovers the science and the human stories behind Brazil's changing life and landscape. Now, Brazil, as we all know, is huge. It's diverse. The population is enormous. The landscape is, is, is just unfathomable for those of us who are from far away. It's, it's huge, but lucky for us, they're not gonna try to cover all of Brazil tonight. They're gonna start with something very, very, very tiny. And you'll know what I mean in just a moment. Please give it up for 37 Grouse. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sara. I'm Bia. 
We really appreciate you coming here tonight with the sad weather outside. We're not really used to the cold. Yeah, it makes me want to cry, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's almost summer in Brazil right now, the most Brazilian season of the year. We have the school breaks, the beaches are crowded, sidewalks are full of bar tables and people drinking beer and caipirinha. And you probably haven't noticed the uninvited guests at this Brazilian party. But they are there and they love it. The heat, the city, the naked legs. It's basically paradise for the mosquitoes. So we have many kinds of mosquitoes in Brazil. But if you live in a city like us, this particular one, Aedes aegypti, is the one you have to watch out for. We just call it the dengue mosquito. It's part of our lives. Even children know how to identify it. It only flies and bites by day. It's very small. It has this fashion zebra outfit. And the most important thing, it transmits not only dengue, but also chikungunya and Zika, three awful diseases. And every summer, we are inundated with ads teaching us how to avoid letting this mosquito breed in our homes. The message is always the same. Check your plant dishes, clean, clean your dog's bowl, don't leave trash out in the rain, put a lid on your water tank. Because they lay eggs on still water, even small puddles. And some of those ads are just amazing. Like this one from the Department of Health. <laughs> Antes da gente encerrar, vamos fazer um jogo rápido. Uma cor. Zzz. Uma época do ano. Zzz. Sol ou chuva? Zzz. Mosquito por mosquito. Zzz. I love this video. It's too good. And all of that is to try to convince us that we really need to pitch in. And you better do it. People from the Mosquito Inspection Program go house to house to look for larvae. And if they find them in your house, you feel so ashamed of yourself, like you failed the country. Yeah, <laughs> because there is the sense of war, a war between Brazil and the dengue mosquito. This year, until September, we had over 1.5 million reported cases of dengue, Zika, and chikungunya in Brazil, with 690 Aedes aegypti-related deaths. And to just give you an idea of how big this problem is, the number of reported Lyme cases in the U.S. in a year is only 30,000. And we wanted to know why. Why does it seem like we're losing this war? Why is it so hard to eliminate these little bastards? <laughs> we wanted to find out. So we went to a mosquito lab at the University of Sao Paulo, and we met Margarete Capujo. Margarete is a scientist who has been studying mosquitoes for 22 years. She originally wanted to be a ballet dancer, and she never thought she would spend her life growing and dissecting mosquitoes. But like most of us, she doesn't have much love for them. In fact, she hates them. Não, eu adoro pôr ele no micro-ondas e ver ele explodir. Aí elas dão uma quedinha dormindo. A hora que o micro-ondas começa, elas começam a voar lá dentro. Pá! Estoura. She still doesn't see one single reason for this insect to exist. Qual é o papel dele dentro do ecossistema? Eu não tenho a menor ideia. Yes, yeah, some animals eat mosquitoes or their larvae, but that's not all they eat. They could easily eat other bugs. So Margaret showed us around her lab and her mosquito farm, and she told us that working with mosquitoes requires some seriously weird procedures. Like putting your own arm inside a mosquito cage to feed them, or rubbing a sedated mouse over your body so the mouse, is mo mouse smells like a human and the mosquito wants to suck its blood. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> her main mission is to understand how the creatures work, as if they were little machines and then she can use this information against them. But can we really dream about a world without mosquitoes? Por que que você acha que você vai eliminar uma coisa que sobrevive desde o Jurássico? Maybe not. She says mosquitoes have faced many challenges over thousands of years, and now they are perfectly adapted to live in today's world, especially in developing and tropical countries. It's hot, it rains, and there's a lot of rubbish and water tanks that can serve as nurseries for mosquito larvae. Also, most people don't have air conditioning and most windows aren't screened, so mosquitoes can fly everywhere and it can bite lots of people. And when we say it, we actually mean she. It is the female that bites and transmits diseases. She's a silent threat inside our houses, pursuing our legs like a psycho, and playing with our cats when we are not around. She does that. Yeah, she uses all her senses to track you. É cheiro, calor. Tem gente que fala que até a voz humana é atrativo. CO2, ácido lático, ATP. 
Eu sei que ela te acha. E ela te acha com tudo. She's a professional killer. If you look at her numbers, sharks look like a fraud. Sharks are lame. But is she really to blame? I mean, we know mosquitoes are responsible for thousands of deaths all over the world every year. But if it wasn't for the bugs they carry, they would just be more of an inconvenient guest. And this little lady, she's just trying to live her life and be a good mother. She bites people not because she wants to infect them, but because she actually needs the blood to lay her eggs. Margaret says that seeing mosquitoes as the only villains doesn't help us solve the problem. Nós temos dengue desde 1950, 40. Tá aí. A estratégia que está sendo usada há 60 anos não está funcionando. Será que não dá na hora de mudar a estratégia? She says that sure, we need to control the mosquitoes, but we should also be at war with the viruses the mosquitoes transmit. And the good news is, we can use the mosquitoes to do that. And that's what she tries to do in her lab. She creates genetically modified mosquitoes. Mosquito GMO. É tão assustador o transgênico. Ele veio do espaço, ele veio da, de Marte, ele é um bicho de sete cabeças, ele é um monstro. I know they actually look like green monsters here, but under natural light, they would look exactly the same as any regular mosquito. And there can be many types of mosquito GMO. Maybe you've heard about the one that carries a gene that will kill its babies. It's been tested in Brazil and even made the news a couple of times. But this type of mosquito is basically an insecticide with wings. You have to make and release new ones all the time for them to work. This is not a lasting solution, and it's not the kind of mosquito GMO Margaret is really passionate about. Now she's trying to engineer mosquitoes that can fight the real villains. Então é o gene drive. Que é, você modificando o mosquito, você elimina o vírus. O teu alvo não é eliminar mosquito. O teu alvo é eliminar vírus. The mosquito becomes a little vigilante. There's a bunch of ways this can work, but basically... You put a set of genes in the mosquito that can recognize a nasty bug, like the dengue virus. And then you let her out. When the vigilante mosquito bites someone with dengue, her new genes will trigger a response, like killing the virus, so the disease can spread to other people. And if there were enough of these GMO mosquitoes around, we could pretty much stop dengue from circulating. But Margaret says nobody is releasing vigilante mosquitoes anytime soon. They are just a lab experiment for now. They may work or not. But one thing is for sure. We need to keep fighting this war with every possible weapon available. And to be honest, it's never going to end. Mosquitoes and viruses, they were here long before us. And they will still be here biting and infecting whatever creatures are around after we're gone. I find that thought a little bit depressing, honestly. <laughs> but you know what makes me feel better? The fact that when it's just me and the mosquito, I can take it. I slap it mid-flight or I throw a magazine at the wall. I'm like, who's the predator now? I like it. I actually throw a pillow that gently crushes them so they don't leave a blood smudge on the wall. My personal favorite is the USB charged electric racket. There's USB everything now. And frying them is just so satisfying. It is. It is amazing. Yes. Do you hear that? Oh, maybe one of them caught a ride in our luggage. It's coming from somewhere in the audience. Guys, if you could please check under your seats. This is a very serious it's situation. It's serious, guys. Check under yeah, your seats. Check I mean, under your seats. Yeah, right now. Guys, learned anything from this, you should really check under your seats. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Wait, 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 but maybe I should just leave it with you. I know the dengue mosquito is not a big problem here right now, but it you might come know. in handy soon. You know, global warming.
you might not have all the snow here in a few years. Take your gift. We are 37 graus. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Obrigada. I've always wanted to say Bye. Yeah. Let's hear it for 37 graus. Who wants to microwave some mosquitoes right now? I want to microwave thousands of mosquitoes right now. All right, we're at the end of our night and it has been so fantastic. But one last time, we want to bring everybody onto the stage, give them a huge round of applause. City of Women. Get on up here. De eso no se habla. Her stage. Cocktails and cancer. Un periodico de ayer. And 37 grouse. Give it up for these amazing teams. Let's also give a big round of applause to the PRX training program who worked with these shows over the past 20 weeks to make this night and so much more possible. Thank you also to Google, of course, for making this possible. Thank you to the Oberon for making this amazing space available. Thank you to the, all the amazing staff here. Thank you to Stephanie Quo, also part of the training team, for handling all the audio and visuals. Hey, Stephanie, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for supporting these amazing creators. Reminder. Please subscribe to all of their shows. You will love every single one. And just a few final announcements, very brief final announcements. If you liked what you saw tonight, we'll have another showcase for our public radio podcasters back here at the Oberon on March 17th. If you're interested in multilingual podcasts like the ones you saw tonight, the PRX Podcast Garage in Alston is hosting a series of events this Friday and Saturday dedicated to breaking down language barriers. It's called Listening to Language. Go to podcastgarage.org for more info. Finally, PRX is a nonprofit empowering creators like these. If you want to support us on Giving Tuesday, which is today, just go to prx.org. And... And we're all now headed down the street to the Grafton Street Pub for an after party. And we would love it if you would all join us. Thank you so much. Have an outstanding night. Thank you to everybody on stage. Good night, everyone. <laughs>